on uh, for doing Ruby stuff with Ida. So, sort of, um, so who am I? Um, I used to work on Metasploit, and uh, uh, that's pretty much my only famous. Um, and yeah. So before we get started, I'd also like to thank Scape uh, for helping with the original design of IDARUB, and then everybody else who helped test it and gave feedback and stuff. And everybody who made TourCon possible, so. So, um, so what is IDARUB? Um, or how many people here have even really, how many people here use IDA on a regular basis? Oh, that's pretty good. Um, so, uh, IDARUB's pretty simple. It's just a IDA pl uh, an IDA plugin that embeds the Ruby interpreter into IDA and then allows um, access to the IDA SDK uh, from, sorry, uh, from Ruby. So you can really add anything that's not already in IDA, it's just making it more convenient. And then the one thing it does do is expose it remotely, which I'll talk about. So um, the original plan was try to build like a, a friendlier SDK, um, but I haven't really done that yet, so. Anyway. So, the first thing people are gonna ask is like, you know, there's already Ida Python, so why even care about doing Ruby? Um, Python is really good, and I looked at it a lot when I was working on Ida Ruby. Um, but, <laughs> I was just sort of doing this for fun, and I wanted to write in Ruby, so, I, and I wanted just to, to write this. Um, and, when we figured out how to do the network model um, and the interactive model, which I think is really important, um, and it's actually probably one of the most valuable pieces about it, uh, and I only knew how to do it for Ruby, so um, instead of trying to make Ida Python do the same thing, um, I just did it all in Ruby, and it wasn't that hard, so. Um, also, we have a lot of other tools that we've written in Ruby, so it'd be nice if we could like have a common ground. Um, but I guess all of the reverse engineering stuff is happening in Python now, so maybe it's a bad idea. But, um, also, the plugin itself is probably a good example for how to write IDA plugins that um, act asynchronously. So one of the biggest problems with IDA that I'll talk about is that it's all single-threaded, so if you want to have any sort of interactive plugins and stuff like that, um, you have to do some tricks. So, so I'm kind of hungover. <laughs> and, th and this is a really boring talk, sorry. Um, so yeah, another thing is um, I have swig wrappers that I wrote that should be, um, I tried to keep the Ruby specific aspects of it as small as possible. So if you wanted to use the same wrappings to wrap the SDK in Python or like Tickle or something, good. Um, so even if you don't care about Ruby at all, um, there might be some useful pieces outside of that, the swig wrappings and the plugins and stuff like that. Um, so like, what were the original goals? Um, so I didn't, so if anybody's written IDC, you know it's kind of like a bad language. Um, and so I guess the goal was to get rid of IDC for like simple stuff. Um, and there's no reason to ever try to replace like full normal plugins. Um, and the actual, the most useful thing I found with Ida Rub is just being able to interactively um, sort of play with Ida and figure stuff out. So um, I actually find myself using it a lot to prototype a plugin that I'll write in C or something. So I'll basically prototype it out in Ruby or sit in an interactive prompt and sort of figure out like what steps I'm gonna go through and then write the whole thing in C. So it's useful for that. Um, yeah, so uh, one interesting thing about Ida Python is they have this big um, IDC compatibility layer. So basically all the functions that you find in IDC are re-implemented in Ida Python. So it's pretty easy to port code that was in IDC to Ida Python. Um, although this is like, like 8,000 lines of Python or something to have this compatibility interface. Um, and that's just a lot of work that I didn't want to do. So I don't have anything like that. Um, so the technical details of works is kind of um, just engineering nitty gritty details, but that's what I'm gonna spend the beginning of this talking about. So um, it's gonna be kind of boring, but I guess it's uh, good to know. Um, also, um, yeah, <laughs> um, the IDA was very difficult. I found a lot of IDA bugs and stuff while working on this. Um, so it was basically like the, the concept of this is really cool, 
then actually making everything work was really complicated because it's just kind of a mess. But anyway. Um, so if we want to access, so people who don't know, Ida is a disassembler and they have a C++ um, API to allow you to automate stuff like add comments and do disassembly and all sorts of stuff. Um, so if we want to access this from a higher level language, we need some sort of uh, wrapper from the high level language to map the C++ interface. So you could even, um, you could either write this by hand, which some people um, do, or there's this tool called Swig. Um, and the nice thing about Swig is at least conceptually, it tries to be decoupled from the language that you're wrapping it to. So you can write Swig bindings, and then you could use it from like Ruby, TCL, Python, blah, 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 blah. Um, and it's a lot quicker to do. Um, although there was a lot of Swig bugs that I dealt with too and stuff. Um, I have to set my like generated code right now and search and replace stuff to make it compile. But anyway, um, so one of the things that I did differently than Ida Python because Ida Python also used Twig, um, but what they did is they modified all of the um, they modified all of the Ida headers so that they would both compile and and they used them to run Swig over them. Um, so you have all of these headers that would sort of be like if def Swig. Um, <laughs> And uh, so, can you, uh, like, uh, anyway, um, the light's like right in my eyes. Uh, yeah, I can't see it all. <laughs> um, so, so basically what I did is I just took two sets of headers. I had one set of headers that I was gonna run Swig over. And since there's a lot of um, functions that Swig not, might not be able to wrap and stuff, I just completely modified that set. So I say like, okay, I don't need this function or I'll just remove it from the headers. Um, so I basically had a cleaned up set of headers that I ran swig over to generate the wrappers, and then I had the normal unmodified headers that I actually build against. Um, so stuff that I can't do with swig right now. Um, number one, Ida uses the same set of headers for both the public interface and for, in, for their internal interface. So there's uh, functions in the header, headers that aren't actually exported in the DLLs. So swig will try to generate wrapper code for that, and then it will be referencing uh, function. So you have to remove any non-exported data or functions. Um, right now I also don't support callbacks. So anything that takes function pointers, um, so a lot of like the user interface functions and stuff like that. So you have to remove any functions with callbacks. And then there's some other little things you have to fix up, um, like defines and stuff like that. Um, so then the way Swig works is you end up writing these things called type maps, which are basically sort of pattern matching on the prototypes of the functions that you're trying to wrap and then you can translate those into specific things. Um, so I had to do a lot of specific stuff for Ida because if you just look at a C API, it's not clear like what's an input argument, what's an output argument, and stuff like that. So there's a lot of um, targeted stuff. But in total, it was only 128 lines of Swig definition, so it's not too bad. Um, and for a lot of the stuff, Swig is sort of um, a pain to work with. So I tried to defer most of the, uh, I tried to defer a lot of stuff just to doing it in Ruby. So be like, okay, I'm gonna wrap this function and it's gonna be kind of lazy and it's not like, you're gonna have to fix up the return values afterwards. But I'll just do that in Ruby instead of doing it in Swig. Um, so then the actual part about embedding Ruby. Um, so in order to do this, um, so I wanted to support both executing scripts locally inside of Ida and remotely. So I just embedded a Ruby interpreter inside of an Ida plugin. Um, and there was a lot of uh, tricky details about this, but. Interesting. So, um, so the way it works is the plugin dynamically links against uh, the Ruby DLL. So you need a normal Ruby installation, but then that's it. And then uh, the Ruby interpreter gets loaded uh, the first time the plugin gets initialized, and then it just stays loaded. Um, so the way Swig generally works is it's made to compile uh, loadable modules. So you usually like compile like a .so or a .dll. Um, so basically, I took just the Swig generated code that would normally be a DLL, and I just compile it in into the plugin. So you just have one uh, DLL that has everything. So there's an Ida plugin with Ruby embedded, and then it has the Swig bindings um, also embedded. Um, and then if you just wanted to do local mode, this would be all that you need. So this is basically what Ida Python is. It's just um, an Ida plugin with a Python interpreter and then Swig bindings. So um, local mode's pretty straightforward. And I thought the coolest thing about this, and I
project if we hadn't gotten to work was the, uh, the network access. So uh, basically what we did is um, you basically write a little RPC mechanism to access the SDK from outside of um, IDA. So there's something in Ruby called DRB, distributed Ruby, and originally I tried that um, just to create like a RPC mechanism. But um, there was tons of crazy problems with it. So I just wrote, it's convenient because since we're swig wrapping stuff, we basically know all of the, the, the types that we're gonna be calling into functions are gonna be really simple. Like I'm not gonna have like an array of hashes of, you know, hashes of arrays or something like that because I'm only calling C functions. So the mapping is pretty much like very simple. So I could write a very simple RPC layer just to marshal all the arguments because none of them were complex. Um, so then I actually just write um, a bunch of Ruby code and then I just the string and put it in the actual C++ code. Um, so the Ruby code for the RPC server is just also embedded in the plugin. Um, and then the, the C code for the plugin is very thin, pretty much defers all of the work into the Ruby, Ruby part which makes things pretty simple. Um, so then you just loop this and you would have remote SDK access, but you wouldn't be able to use IDA at the same time. Um, so this would basically be like, you'd have a server that would be non-functional um, and it would just allow IDA access. Um, so uh, doing the RPC part in Ruby is fairly simple because it's a dynamically typed language and it has built in like marshalling and stuff like that. So you can just sort of say, okay, I have this object, now I want a string representation of it, and I'm gonna send it over the network and then unmarshal it on the other end. Um, although, when you mix in the swig uh, objects, it gets a lot more interesting. The swig objects are these lightweight C++ objects that get wrapped into Ruby, and then they basically just wrap like a pointer to an IDA object. Um, so this isn't information that you could send across. Um, because it's all wrapping C++ data structures. So Ruby has no way of being able to inspect uh, that object and like serialize it and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, the RPC mechanism is just very simple. Like you send a request to call an API and you get the response, the return value. Um, so then another concept that I stole from DRB is the idea of a front object, which is just um, when you initially connect to the RPC server, you need something to start calling methods on so you get an initial object called the front object. Um, so this is the starting point to call any methods. Um, so basically the way the protocol works is pretty simple. I just send an array that, uh, over an array in the network, which is um, the object that I'm gonna call a method on, the name of the method, and then any args. And then uh, I just get the return values back. And if there's any uh, exception thrown, I catch the exception and send that back to you. So that's pretty cool. Um, so you could support callbacks, although it makes things a lot more complicated. And um, the only things I initially looked at that needed callbacks were user interface code. And I figured if you were writing remote scripts in Ruby, there's no need to be using that um, user interface. So I didn't support callbacks at all. Okay. So one other engineering detail. Um, so there's some objects that you can marshal easy and make sense on the client side. So for example, say I call an IDA function and it returns a string. Um, I can just send over all of the data for that string and it makes complete sense to the client. So primitives, strings, integers, exceptions, um, these are all easy to marshal and they make perfect sense on the side. Um, but unfortunately with IDA um, and wrapping all of this stuff, there's all of these objects that won't make any sense on the client. So even if I could marshal um, like a swig object, you'd basically end up with the client having a pointer to some memory in the IDA server. So um, and that is completely useless to the client. So um, this is pretty much the case for all IDA instances, classes, structures. Um, and they would be difficult to marshal even if you could marshal them. Uh, and then you would also require the client to have knowledge of all of the constants and all of the classes and all of the class definitions and stuff right now. So the way it's designed right now is that um, the client is super thin and it doesn't have knowledge of like any of the um, IDA stuff. So you could basically reuse the client for something completely different than IDA. It's just sort of a generic RPC mechanism. Um, so what you have to do is, so for types that aren't simple like uh, integers and strings, you basically 
client like a proxy object. So they just sort of get this thing that I call a reference object. Um, so then they have this dummy little stub that just has an ID that uh, correlates it back on the server side. Um, so then when you call methods on this, you basically say, I'm calling method foo on reference object one, two, three, four, and I have no idea about it. And then the server keeps all of the objects. Um, so this is just a way to proxy all of those uh, objects that we wouldn't be able to. Um, so basically the way this implemented is um, when this, the RPC server calls a IDA function, it gets all the return values, and then it walks through all the return values, um, and it has like a whitelist of things not to, uh, not to reference, so if like strings and booleans and stuff like that. But if there are complex types, so say like, you know, an IDA structure or something like that, then what it does is it replaces the object with a reference, basically a ticket, and then it stores the actual object in a place where it can get it back. Um, so then uh, there's a custom marshalling routine on reference objects, and they're just represented by this uh, four byte value um, that, we, that the server uses to look back the object when the client sends it back. Um, so then the server tracks all of these reference objects um, per session. One of the nice features about IDAREB is that you can connect uh, multiple clients at the same time, and then all the objects are separate between uh, the clients. Although this can be sort of tricky because the way, I'll, maybe I'll talk about it a little bit later, but the way IDA does some of their memory management um, doesn't really make it possible to uh, have multi-user setup because um, there's a lot of functions that will internally allocate stuff into like static buffer and then return you a pointer to it. So if two people, um, two independent people called the same function, the data is going to get overwritten because I just were using one thing. So I designed it so I, in theory multiple people could be using this, but it turns out that it doesn't really work um, because of the limitations of how Ida does that. Um, so, um, yeah, so the client, um, when the client gets back any reference objects from the server, it attaches a session to them, which is basically just um, a channel to contact the server. So in the case of a normal thing, this will just be like a TCP socket. So basically, you end up having a reference object that also has uh, a member variable that's the TCP um, socket. So then you can just call methods on, um, on the object, and then it knows how to go talk to the server. Um, so then implementation details, but it gets caught with method missing, remotely dispatches. And one of the nice things is that because the session object is tied to specific reference objects, you can have um, multiple connections to different IDA servers and stuff like that, and I'll demonstrate something like that. Um, yeah, there's some issues with garbage collection because obviously if a client has references to objects on the server, the server has no way of knowing what objects the client's referencing. So basically, um, it leaks memory until you disconnect and then it So, some actual demonstration, because that was really boring. Um, does anybody have any questions yet? Okay. So, I'll just open a random IDB here. Um, so, this is, this is IDA, and then I can just launch my plugin, and then I can just start the server. It started on localhost port one two three four one two three four. Um, so I'm just in an interactive Ruby shell right now, and then I just connected to the server. You can see in IDA accepted client, um, and now I just have an IDA object that I can call functions on. So I can say um, like IDA dot screen EA, and that will tell me the address of the current, the current, like, cursor position. Um, so you can do whatever, ida dot, um, like, get cursor, and it will return the 12, 7, or my x and y coordinates, stuff like that. Um, so basically, this is, I mean, it's pretty simple to see, but, so what's happening is that um, this ida, you can actually see, this is,
um, a, ref a reference object that references uh, the IDA class on the server side. So then any, any calls to here get caught and get dispatched to IDA and then the responses get brought back. So if I call a method that like doesn't exist, um, you can see undefined method. Um, but if you look, this is actually in plug and receive. So this exception actually happened on the IDA server side and then gets translated back over to the client. Um, so it doesn't look like much when you actually use it, which is sort of the idea. But um, anyway, so that's basically the general use. Um, so some other cool stuff you can do. Um, so one thing is really nice. The, the thing I found most nice about Ida Rub is just being able to sort of like play interactively with the Ida SDK because sometimes it's not always clear um, how to achieve something. So um, you can do stuff like give me all of the methods in Ida. And then I can say like, I want to grab for things that deal with byte. And I say like, you know, is byte, do byte, or maybe I want to like patch. So patch byte, patch word, patch long. Um, and then also I can figure out like what, what methods or what, how many arguments they take. So I say, I did patch byte. It says wrong number. You gave me zero arguments. I expected two. So obviously patch byte is going to take like an address and then the byte to patch the, the new value. So it's pretty nice just to be able to like interactively um, query Ida and then like grep for stuff because it's the headers are sort of really hard to get all the information out of. So this is, you know, um, so um, so I showed the exceptions are proxied, um, and then also in order to access constants, you can say like Ida dot bad adder, um, which is all Fs. So um, this constant access is also proxied to the server so that the client doesn't need to know, like any of the constants. So the client doesn't need to know like what bad adder is and stuff. It fetches it from the server. So the client's really thin, um, which is pretty nice. Okay. So then, um, and if we, it takes more work to make IDA still usable while you're running the, uh, the, the server. Um, so IDA is single threaded and it's not thread safe. So you can, you can start another thread in IDA to call some functions, but chances are there's gonna be like a lot of race conditions and um, it's just not like a reliable way of doing this. So there's a few different approaches that you can take, but what we ended up doing um, is we need our RPC server and the GUI to share the same thread. So that's the easiest way to do it. Um, so how we did this is you create um, a, w a hidden window and then a handler, and then you use a, a Windows API called uh, WinSock async select. And basically what happens is when there's any network activity on a socket, um, it's like a select, but then it creates a message to a given window and then our handler handles it. And that will all happen in the main GUI thread. Um, so when you start the uh, Adderub plugin, it's gonna create a hidden window, we call it the control window. This window has a window handler, and then we set up select on any sockets we have, for example, the server socket. Our plugin returns, and as far as Ida thinks, we just had a plugin that ran for like one second, and it doesn't, it thinks we're completely done. Um, but when there's any messages on the socket that we set up the select for, um, a window message will get sent, and Ida will process this message in its GUI loop and dispatch it to our handler. So we sort of have an interrupt-driven IDA interface. So whenever we have network events, we have a way of processing those network events inside of the same main thread that IDA is running in. And this is basically what you have to do in order to be able to call IDA SDK functions um, without blocking the GUI thread indefinitely. Um, so this is a really bad diagram that you probably can't see anyway. But um, basically the way that this entire process would work is um, a user would call like new client we connect on the network. Um, it's gonna send a window message to IDA. It's gonna get dispatched into the C portion of the plugin, get dispatched into the Ruby portion of the plugin. Um, and then it's gonna return back the front object. And then you're gonna have this front object, for example, IDA. And then you're gonna call a method on it. It's gonna marshal all the arguments over. It's gonna create another window message, get processed in the C, processed in the C part of the plugin. Processed in the Ruby part of the plugin. Um, the method's gonna get called by a swig. All the arguments are going to get marshaled back, transformed to reference objects that they need to be, sent back over the network, and returned to the caller. Pretty exciting. Um, so, 
lot of considerations um, with this design. So one is that there's a very high latency um, for, any, for any function call you're gonna make to the IDA SDK. Um, so because we have to go through this whole step of you, you marshal the data, you send it over the network, causes a window handler, gets processed. Um, so you can basically sort of think of API calls to IDA like you would think of like system calls or something like that, but even slower. So you wanna try to do things um, that minimize the number of API calls. But IDA was obviously not designed to be, um, have high latency method calls like this. So the functions aren't designed to do like batch operations. It's pretty much like it's common to have to call tons and tons of methods in like a loop to do anything. Um, so it's kind of unfortunate because uh, your plugins can potentially be really slow because it has to go over the network for all these calls. Um, so one alternative you could do is you could write specialized functions on the server side that do batch processing. So basically you'd give it like a list of tasks to do and then would do them all and then return back the list of results. And this would help with the latency. Um, but since it also supports executing scripts locally, and then obviously you're not running over the network, um, you can do that too. So basically if you have performance critical scripts, you can just run them locally and otherwise you can run them over the network and it works fine. So um, in terms of security, there isn't any because we have this generic RPC mechanism where we can just um, call any methods on any objects inside the interpreter. Um, so there's not really any, any protection. Um, and there's no password or SSL or anything like that. So if you expose uh, the, the IDA rub service um, on the network, then anybody can run commands and do whatever, execute code. Um, does anybody have any questions on that part yet? Sorry, these details are all really terribly boring, but. Um, so the plan for the future is, um, so I, I spent a lot of time, I sort of glanced over a lot of these details because um, there's just a lot of, there's a lot of pieces that were just very implementation like details like, oh, you know. So I spent a lot of time working on like the foundations to make it really reliable um, and generic and stuff like that. So, um, but I haven't actually written that many IDA rub scripts. So I tr I'm starting to try to do, um, and then also there was another person who was working on a, a higher level API for IDA rub. So um, there's someone who's not me, some um, guy who I don't know very well, released uh, this like API on top of IDA rub that allows you to have more Ruby-like access. Um, so I don't have any higher level, higher level APIs, but someone else does. Um, and I started to work on something called IDA Rutils, which is like IDA rub utilities. And there is some like higher level access for certain types of stuff. Um, another thing is right now the network protocol is basically just um, serialized Ruby objects, but there's no reason why the network protocol couldn't be language independent. So if I wanted to make it like XML RPC or something like that. And then, um, then Python or any other language could use the same backend. So finally some demos. Um, so I think it's time to do some sweet graphics because, uh, all right. So I'll start up with something I hacked up quickly. Um, so basically the way these scripts work um, is pretty simple, but you just call like idarub.autoclient, which will automatically parse the command line and figure out like the host name and IP ad or the, the host name and port. And then uh, that returns an IDA object and then you can just call any method that would be in the IDA SDK on that IDA object. So I call like get screen, a, scre screen EA to get the current address and stuff like that. So this is a pretty simple script. Um, and then let me run it. So this is a breakout implemented in IDA, and I'm actually using the cursor inside of IDA to move around the breakout. So. <laughs> I don't actually do any reverse engineering, so. Oh, oh I got it stuck. Anyway, <laughs> I need to work on that. Um, all right. So, what else do I have? Um, so basically, the way that works is, um, 
since this is being interrupt driven, I can still use the IDA GUI while um, scripts are running because the scripts are only being, they're only interrupting IDA to run when they need to. So basically the way that works is I just made a little breakout game and then I just like generate the string for the screen and I just push all of the frames to IDA in a comment. Um, so you actually can see it, it's pretty simple. So you just say like, um, is for the, the thing and then I just set a function comment with the string. Um, so I just do this in a loop. And then um, I also, you can see I call ida.getCursor. So I just query the cursor position every move and then based on where the cursor is, you can see I'm moving it around, that changes where the paddle is. So yeah, that's how that works. So it's pretty simple um, and that's kind of the cool part about it is that all of, the, all, all of this code, um, you can do stuff like that. Um, some other demos. So, I think there's a few unique ideas in IDArub that make it particularly useful. So, one of the things is collaboration. Um, both the server and the clients were designed so that a client can connect to multiple servers or connect to the same server multiple times, and a server can be uh, connected to by multiple clients. So, this allows things like have one script that connects to five different servers um, and then does some sort of collaboration. So um, one example of this is maybe you want to port, port some comments between one IDB to the other. Um, so a simple way you could do this is you have one IDA rub script that connects to two different instances of IDA and then you just scan for the comments in the one and port them over to the other. So you could extend this to do some sort of like IDA sync type thing. So. So I have a little example set up here. So this is just um, a database where I have some comments here. Um, and then the same database, just without the comments. Um, and then I'll start the server here. Oh, oops. I'll start a server here. So now I have two different servers, one running on 1234 and one running on 1235. Um, and then I wrote this really small script that will port the comments between the two. So, um, and I have a little shell script that I sleep for two seconds so I can switch over to the windows. And then I just run comment, um, telling it to comment between those two different databases. And then you can see that it scanned and then ported the comments over to the second window. So you can definitely do stuff like that, which can be pretty useful. So you could say like, okay, I'm working on one, analyzing one piece of code. Someone else is sharing the same piece of code. Now I want to connect and synchronize like the names of our variables or synchronize comments and stuff like that. Um, so the collaboration aspect I think is pretty important. Um, another thing I think is pretty nice about it is being able to integrate it. Since you have a way of calling IDA remotely, you can call IDA from any environment so you can call it from, you know, like a Solaris box or something. Um, and you can just write scripts that you can just pass command line arguments and get the values back. So it makes it really nice um, for just being able to integrate into other stuff. Um, so here's an example um, that I did after seeing PyMay um, was that it's really useful, and um, Luis talked about this too, but being able to integrate debuggers and disassemblers and stuff like that. So um, a few lines of Ruby, I wrote up this script that will um, debug something and then uh, resolve the data dynamically. So I'll show that. So this is Minesweeper. Um, and then the idea is that um, there's this data section in the executable which is uninitialized so it's not stored in the binary at all, but obviously there's going to be values at runtime. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a script that debugs a win, win mine process interactively and then allows you to query these values and set them as comments. Um, so I'm actually SSH'd into my uh, OSX laptop here just to also show the network aspects of it and stuff. Um, 
So I just have this little uh, resolve data script that just goes through and connects with the, uses Meterpreter to connect to the, um, to the bug, the process, and then query the data. So it's pretty simple. Um, okay. So start here, and then I will run a copy of Minesweeper. And then what I can do is I can say resolve data. And then you see it connected the WinMime process at PID 2888. And then it found where the IDA cursor was at that address, and then what the value of it at that address is. And then it sets that as a comment. So I can just do this again. And I can go through and resolve data for any of these uh, values in a live running process. So that's sort of some ideas for doing debugger IDA interaction and stuff like that. Um, so all of these comment values are coming runtime from Minesweeper. So if I close it, obviously this is going to break. So anyway, um, so that's one of the ideas between integration. Um, when you have when you have this sort of taken out of IDA and just callable from a script, um, there's you can start interacting with all different pieces. I could have like a Python script that calls some Ruby stuff, and then uh, makes it a lot easier. And I have some other examples for that. So one really cool thing is. Um, I whipped up this quick GDB integration. Um, so it's just some GDB init hacks and a few lines of Ruby, and it builds GDB to IDA link. So I will demonstrate that. Um, so this is just slash bin slash ls on OSX. Um, so go over here to the beginning, and this is the entry point. Um, so I'll set my cursor up here on the beginning of the program, and then I will type GDB bin ls. Um, after I start the server. Okay. Um, so I can type Ida break, and it queried Ida and found that the cursor was at 1C32, and it set a breakpoint there. So I just set a breakpoint wherever the cursor was. Now I can run. And now I broke on that instruction. Um, and so now, move this over here. So I can type um, Ida step instruction, and it will step to the next instruction and then tell Ida to follow along. So you can see the yellow uh, cursor is following along as I step through this code. Um, and then I can Ida comment and say like, blah. Um, and that will set a comment at the current instruction, or at the current line I'm debugging. So I can step again um, and then say something else. Um, so this is really tiny amount of stuff, and it's actually pretty useful to be able to, because the hardest part is, so now I'm like, say I'm gonna step into this call. It's really nice to be able to like, just, you know, keep on stepping through all of this stuff and having Ida just follow along. So, and the way that's implemented is pretty simple. Um, there's just this GDB init script, and it just shells out to a little Ruby wrapper, and then, the G, and then that's, uh, And then that's just like this much code. So in pretty much GDB star, in 51 lines of code, you can write, and it's including the GDB wrapper and the Ruby script, you can write a little bridge to bridge uh, GDB and Ida together. Um, so you could do the same things. And, and by the way, this is on um, Darwin. So you can see it's you know happening over the network and all of that stuff. It's pretty cool. Um, So um, another thing I did, which I'm not going to demonstrate because it doesn't really, uh, it's not that interesting to see happen, but um, I wrote this thing called Model, which was used for um, getting interfaces for Microsoft RPC functions. Um, so it was like, you know, 3.3 th uh, 3, thousand lines of code. And then I basically just wrote a small adapter to interact with IDARUB because before it would just take a DLL from the command line and then do everything internally. And instead, I just backed it to an IDA database. And then you can add comments and all that sort of stuff. Um, so that's another place where integration is really nice, because now with 80 lines of code, I can just sort of uh, start talking with IDA instead of talking to uh, the file system. And then I can add comments and all that sort of stuff. Um, so then this is just on the topic of um, how you can still interact with IDA while the plugins are running. Um, so, for example, I want this. Um, I have this script that calls Blink. And it just 
loop, setting a comment on and off, and you can see I can still like scroll around and blah 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 like while while it's going. So if you want to have really annoying IDA databases that say like, you know, I don't know. Um, so then another cool thing about this is that, like I said, IDA supports um, multiple connection, the multiple clients at the same time. So I can go crazy <laughs> with a bunch of blinks up in here. And then, so you can see I have multiple clients at the same time. These are all separate scripts, right, all running. Um, and do stuff like that. Um, also, there's the much improved version of Blink, which is the marquee. <laughs> and I can throw, throw in some Blinks and that shit on top of it. So, it's like the GeoCities of Ida. <laughs> So that's sort of give you an idea of, um, so I mean, it may not obviously be clear. Um, so the, one of the nice things about being able to still interact with IDA is, and be able to uh, talk to it at the same time is that you can have like an interactive shell and then you can basically be working in IDA and working in a shell and sort of doing stuff like that. But also you could have scripts that sort of stay in the background, like, you know, query, query something every minute and see if something updated or something like that. So you can sort of have, um, jobs running to do different sorts of stuff. So you could have something running that's talking to a server and then when it gets a new message that like you should update a comment if you're writing some collaboration tool and then it can do that. And it doesn't affect um, using IDA. So normally when you run an IDA plugin it just pops up this box saying like the plugin's running and you can't use IDA at all. So, um, oh yeah. So, yeah so none of my scripts actually do anything related for reverse engineering. So this is just sort of a joke because they're all stuff. Um, but, so then something else is, so, so this is a, a game of life in, a, in an IDA comment. And the way this is just working is I just wrote a quick game of life forward and then I just push the frames to a comment and then it sort of goes on. Um, so then I also had a pre-prepared board for something cooler. So I can, so I set up a glider gun so you can sort of get some glider gun action going on. <laughs> um, and then I had a few other demos. So never gonna end. Um, so I did this. Okay. So one thing I actually did that was really um, handy and was a good use of Ida Rub and actually did evolve reverse engineering is um, if you look at um, any OSX binaries, for example, I will take LS. Um, do I still have it open? Yes. So um, if you look at uh, the way they do this, all OSX binaries are compiled with fpick, so all of the code is position independent. So if you see this, this call instruction right here, um, all it does is it takes the value of the next instruction and puts it into EBX, and then all of these addresses are relative to EBX. So basically, all of the, uh, all of the data accesses are relative to the, the current function. Um, so it just gets, basically gets EIP, and then addresses everything relative to that. So Ida knows any of the, the references from these because they're all, um, I mean, Ida doesn't know, doesn't understand the codes, so it doesn't know what's going on. Um, so all of these addresses are completely useless because um, they're just relative to EBX and we don't know anything about it. So I wrote this little script and also demonstrate the local mode then. Um, so if I run the plugin again after it's already uh, running, it just gives you the option to stop it. So I'll stop it. Um, so then I wrote this little thing reverse engineering parallels. Um, uh, yeah. So I just wrote this little code that walks through and it will find all of these get EIPs and then calculate all the addresses and then fix up all of the references for you. So if I run this, I can select, instead of starting a server, I can select to load a file. And then I can pick this convert offsets. Um, so then what it does is I, I just name this function f redder ebx 
um, and it, it knows how to find it. So then I click OK, and it finds all these functions that called this uh, thunk, and then it will update all of the EBX relative addressing to actually be the uh, absolute address. And then you can see we actually have all of the names and addresses. So this is like mock init routine, this was the environment pointer, and this was argv and argc, stuff like that. So, um, and it did it for the whole database. So you can see all of these, um, all of these places are fixed up. Let me find some other examples of it. But um, and that was pretty simple to do because I mean it wouldn't have been a hard thing to do in C++ either. But I mean it's a really simple script and it's nice just to be able to do that sort of stuff while you're working on a project. Um, so I'll close this. And then another thing is I was doing some OSX stuff and um, for Objective-C binaries, I don't have a copy of this, I wish I did, but you basically, the disassembly is really rough because, um, well number one, this is PPC, so you have, um, it's a bit different and um, all the Objective-C calls are done at runtime and so there's not really any information. So I wrote an IDAREV script that will just, um, go through an Objective-C binary and um, it will, it, all of these names were generated by the script. So like message share instance, class reference preferences, message set serial number. Um, so yeah, that's another thing that was really useful and really easy to do. I just sort of, you know, walk through and then you can set all of these names um, to actually what the, the values are and stuff. Um, so if you do any uh, OSX reverse engineering, this is really helpful. So I think that was pretty much um, all I've had for the demos. Um, it's not that exciting because it's basically stuff you could do in IDA from the beginning. It's just making it easier to do. So it just allows you to write simpler si scripts and stuff like that to sort of hack stuff up. But so I have 10 minutes left uh, for questions if anybody has any. Yeah. Um, yeah, I know. I'm trying to think there's actually a good reason not to do. Well, some of, the, some of the RPC stuff I wouldn't actually know how to do in Python, but I imagine that you could do the same sort of stuff. Um, s someone talked about maybe trying to do the network dispatching stuff in Ida Python, um, but I haven't seen anything about it. But, um, any real questions? <laughs> Anybody want to see those again? More games of life? Each board's unique. <laughs> <laughs> Hours of fun. <laughs> All right. Uh, all right. Well, that's it then. Thanks.